this. Sin is not the focus. He's not sin focused. God's not sin focused. I know a lot of his church are sin focused. Ever meet those people? They're just sin focused. It's all about sin and, and, and sin this and bad this and bad that. But, but, but God's focus is relationship. When God created man, he had this beautiful, intimate relationship with man where God was in charge and man was subservient to God with complete trust because he could trust God because he knew everything that came out of the heart of the Father for man was good. God had the best of intentions for us and he has the best of intentions for you. He's not out to rob your fun. He's not out to rob your joy. He's not out to to limit your experiences in life. What he's trying to do is get you to follow him because it's a little bit like a goldfish. Anyone have have a goldfish and you put it on the kitchen bench one day? Not in the bowl, just the fish on the bench. Anyone ever do that? They don't last real long. Uh, we had a bird once, and, and, and anyway, I won't go there, Dale and Chloe's here. Found it in the bottom of the perch. It was still intact, but there was no life in it. You know, it was just there. It looked like a bird. It looked like a bird, had feathers and a beak, but there was no life in it, you know. I think a lot of people are like that. They look, we look like we're alive, but we're not alive. There's a difference between being alive and having life and just simply existing. And, and, and Jesus came that we would not just simply exist, but so that we could be reconnected with life and we could actually experience life in its fullest. I know that's not the message that the world tells us, particularly young people today. The message the world tells you is that you need to get out there and experience and do all these things because that's, you know, but there's a story in these ancient writings of a guy, we know him as the prodigal son. He went out there and did all that stuff and in the end realised, you know what, the experiences are just not filling that need, that relationship at home with my father. F- Filled. So, so he went out there, did that, and then came back, which is a bit of a sad story because all these other decisions he had to make, if he had just made the right decision earlier on and not gone out and done all that, he wouldn't have had to make the decisions to come back. But some people go out and they've got to make the decisions to come back. But the point is this, that everything God has in store for you is coming from the heart of a loving Father who intimately fashions you and knows you and wants relationship with you. And if there's stuff in your world that is stopping the deepening of that relationship, then he wants to put his finger on it. He wants to deal with that. Everyone, everyone, anyone experienced that in life? Things that you just know that they're just not healthy for your relationship with God. They're, they're things that are pulling you back, slowing you down. What they're doing is they're robbing you of this thing called life that Jesus came to give us. The thief, John 10.10, 10, comes to steal, kill, destroy. I've come that you might have life. So whatever it is that he's trying to do in your world, trying to outwork, the end result is it's life. He wants you to have life and have it to its maximum, fullest potential. That's your heavenly father. That's what he has for you. And the, the story of Christmas was, was Emmanuel, God is with us, that God. When, when, when Jesus was born into this earth, it was, it was this continuation of, of the presence of God now down here available to everybody. Not just in the Old Testament where the the, the Holy Spirit would come on prophets, priests and kings, would come upon certain people for a task. So, So the presence of God was there to do something. And then when that thing was done, the presence of God could go. Whereas the presence of God is here now with us to be with us. God with us because God loves us and He wants relationship with us and He wants a relationship with everybody here. I don't know everybody in this room this morning. I don't know your background. don't know where you've come from. I don't know your story. But if you hear nothing else that comes out of my mouth this morning, just know this. uh, God loves you and He wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to do life with you. I want to just point out a couple of, of, of scriptures here because last week we talked about uh, God being with us and we looked at Luke 2.10 and this is what the angel said to the shepherds. He came to them and the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The story of Jesus is good news. It's good news that's meant to produce great joy in who? In everyone. That's the heart of the Father. That's God's intention, is that this good news would produce great joy in the hearts of all people. I don't care what your background is, what your experience has been, what you think of yourself. This is about what God thinks of you. This is what God thinks of you. God so loved you that He gave something to you. You might not think you're worth it. You might not think. That's the beautiful thing about a gift is when I give a gift to somebody, it doesn't matter whether they feel like they deserve it or not. What matters is I feel like they do. That's why I gave it to them. 
So you can sit there and go, oh, I don't deserve this gift. That's fine. You can, you can have all kinds of thoughts about yourself. It doesn't change the fact that the person that gave it to you thinks you're worth it. And God thinks you're worth it. Isn't that awesome? Creator of the universe thinks that you're worth it right now. I don't know what you think you are uh, right now. You're just a speck on the tip of a pin in the midst of a haystack, in the midst of a field, in a little town, in a little city. In a, like, so minuscule, so seemingly insignificant, but yet to God, each of us are so incredibly significant. What a beautiful thought. But what's interesting is that's the message that the angel gave to the shepherds. But it doesn't take long for God's reality to not become humanity's reality. If you jump over to Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, just after they've received this message, remember, this is good news that will produce joy for all people. And then the first person they go and tell is this dude called Herod, this king. Who, who Herod doesn't have a great reputation, by the way. He's not a real good dude. But he happens to be running the place. And so they come and they tell Herod. And they say, we need to know where this baby was born. And so on. And Herod is, is aware. Herod is, is, he was born uh, in Arabia. He's Arabian by descent, but he's, he's, he's a practicing Jew at this time. So he knows the prophecies. He knows about this king of the Jews that's supposedly coming. And of course, hearing that that king has arrived is a bit of a threat to his own authority that he's yielding at the time. And Herod was a nasty guy. Herod had had, I think, two of his own sons were killed because they were becoming more popular than him, so he killed them. I think he murdered one of his wives for the same reason. And I think he took all his female servants and he tortured them and he beat them to try to get them to give him any information about anybody else out there that might end up more popular than him. This is the sort of guy he was, a very insecure leader. And so he hears about Jesus, this baby. That's why after he heard about it, what did he do? He tried to find out where and when. And then he goes, right, yo, every male that was born in that time period in this region, they're going to go and kill them all. So they slaughtered all these children. That's how threatened he felt by this one child. His authority was threatened by Jesus. It says in Matthew 2, 3, it says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Whatever happened to this is good news that will produce great joy in all people. All people except Herod and the leaders in Jerusalem, of course. You see, the presence of God is not necessarily good news to everybody, is it? The presence of God can be disturbing to people. Knowing that God is with you can be disturbing to people. We live in a world today, uh, and you don't have to be a brain scientist to see this. We are trying to take the, the story of Jesus out of the public narrative. We don't want to talk about Jesus anymore. We don't want Bibles in schools. We don't want prayers in schools. We, 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 let's just eliminate the, the story of Jesus. If we can eliminate the story of Jesus for one generation, then maybe that next generation, maybe we're one generation away of, of, of people not talking about it, not preaching about it. Maybe the church can morph itself into a completely social welfare organisation where we do all the practical needs. And this is interesting to me, and I have these discussions with my wife. Isn't it interesting? We live in a culture and a society. We want the fruit of what Jesus has done in your life, but we don't want the message that got you there. We want the fruit of the church. I'm reading a book at the moment by um, Dixon. Uh, it's called Jesus Skeptic. Anyone ever read that book? Great book. Isn't that a great book? And, and what he does is he's, he's talking about, uh, he's an American guy, but he goes back and he looks at, 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 at um, politics and he looks at uh, the ending of the slave trade in America and he looks at education and he looks at the hospital system and he goes back and the bottom line conclusion of what he comes to is this, you take Jesus out of human history, you don't have that. Because it was followers of Jesus that first stood up and said, you know what, men and women are equal. It was followers of Jesus that stood up and said, black and white are equal. It was followers of Jesus that stood up and said, whether you can afford it or not, you deserve medical care. Uh, it was followers of Jesus that started public education. So we want the fruit of God's presence in your life. I just don't want the message and I don't want to know how it got there. So the message of God's presence is disturbing for some people. Why is it disturbing for some people? Here's why I think. And it can be disturbing for some people in the church as well. And here's what I think. I think because the theory of having God's presence in our lives is much more palatable to us than the reality of having God's presence in our lives. The theory of God with us is much more palatable and safe and comfortable and 
for some of us maybe secure than the actual reality of God's presence with our life. If theoretically God is with me and working all things for good, that's one thing. But if practically God is with me, working all things, and I'm whinging and complaining about all things, but God's working all things, that's different. The theory is a lot more palatable to me than the actual reality of the presence of God being in my life. How many of you know that God wants to work in us and through us, but we just want God to work around us? God wants to work in us and He wants to work through us, but we want a God who just wants to work around us. We're not the first people to feel that way. Jesus' disciples were the same. Mark chapter 4. The, the disciples get into a boat with Jesus and a storm whips up. And we, you all know, if you come here regularly, you know the story because I bang on about this one all the time. And a storm whips up. And, and these ancient documents, Mark writes and he tells us that when this happened, he said that the, 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 the disciples began to freak out and they start accusing Jesus of not caring. It's, they're freaking out and he's asleep on a pillow. Which, which makes me wonder, that pillow must have been soaking with water. Just a side issue. Can't stand a wet pillow. Anyway, he's asleep on a pillow. And, and what happens is, in the midst of this storm, the disciples are freaking, he's asleep, and they actually come down to Jesus and they give him a bit of a kick. And they say, wake up. Don't you care that we are perishing right now? Don't you care? And so Jesus jumps up, and what does he do? We all know the story. He what? He what? Gee. Yeah. He calms the storm, quiets the storm, peace be still. And he takes this, this erratic environment and he just calms it down. But that's not the miracle that he intended in that moment. How do I know that? Because then he turns to his disciples and he rebukes them. Where was your faith? Where was your faith? See, God, God wanted to work in them in order to work through them, but they just wanted him to work around them. You just calm the storm. And Jesus goes, you know what? I've got a better idea. Why don't you calm yourself and lay down next to me and learn the lessons of life and we'll ride this storm out together. I'm in the storm with you, remember. I'm in the storm too. I want to work in you and through you, but so many of us just want Him to work around us. You know why God wants to work in you? Here's why. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have it. And so Jesus is sitting there and a couple of chapters later, the disciples are in, guess what? They're in another storm. And so Jesus is going, learn the lessons in the storm because you're going to go through another one. And those lessons will help you get through that one. And what you learn in that one will help you get through that one. And that'll help you get through the next one and so on while we're on this journey to being conformed into the image of Jesus. He wants to work in you and through you, but we want Him to work around us. We're happy for God to do everything. Oh, you know, I made, this, I made this fatal mistake one day of complaining about something. Can't remember what it was. This is going back a few years now. And I complained about something going on in my world. Anybody ever have people, and you'll know what I mean when I say this, they know how to push your buttons. Anyone have those people in their life? I must be the most sinful person here. I'm the only person here. You guys are holier than me. Why? Or you're fibbing. And I know some of you well enough to know probably fibbing. I used to, I, I had this person in my world and they used to push my buttons and I would limit my time with that person and the reason that, that I would limit my time is I would, I would walk away and I would say, oh, oh they push my buttons. So I don't spend time with that person because they know how to push my buttons. And one day, very gently, the Holy Spirit said this to me, They're push, they, they might be pushing your buttons, but guess what? They're your buttons. See, I just wanted to be in an environment where no one's pushing my buttons. 
Whereas the Holy Spirit saying to me, why don't we have a chat about some of those buttons? Let's talk about some of those buttons. Because I can create an environment where no one pushes the buttons, but the buttons are still going to be there. And they're still going to be yours. So why don't we talk about the buttons? I don't like talking about buttons, God. I just want you to calm the storm. I'm like the disciples. Calm the storm. Take away everything, every jagged edge, everything that, that annoys me, frustrates me, makes me uncomfortable, makes me feel insecure. Take it all away from me, God, and then I'll be a rock. But that's just not the way God works. I wish He did. I know that there's great trains of gospel message thought out there at the moment that come to Jesus your life will be perfect you'll never have pain struggles problems again I know that I know that gets preached a lot I just unfortunately I didn't hear Jesus preach that but I did hear Jesus promise I'll never leave you nor forsake you I'll be with you in the fire I'll be with you through the storms let me do what I'm trying to do in your life where is he going with all this I can see some cogs ticking over Here's what I want to do. In a second, I want to play a little video clip. But like most of you, Christmas was really busy and so on. And so I've been sitting with God and, and going, okay, Lord, what? this is our last time together for 2020. Lord, what do you want to do? And here's what I feel like God wants to do. I feel like there is some unfinished business in people's hearts. There are things in 2020 that God has spoken to you. There are things in 2020 God might have shown you about yourself, about the world around you. There are, there are dealings, there are interactions that God's had with you. Invitations He's extended to you this year. And you know, many of us have the best of intentions and we go, yes, Lord, let's work on this. Let's walk through this. Let's deal with this. Let's have this conversation. Yes, Lord, I'm going to go and find someone. I'm going to open up about this weakness in my life and become accountable. Yes, God, I'm going to go and, and, and see a counsellor to help me with that. Yes, God, I'm going to uh, go and, and see that person and apologise and say, I'm sorry. Yes, God, I'm going uh, I'm going to do all these things. And we have the best of intentions. But it's like I heard the other day. I heard a guy say, uh, three people were sitting at a coffee shop one of them decided to leave. How many were left? And then he said three. Because just because you decide something, it's not real till you do it. It's not real till you do it. And you know what? I bet you there are people here in this room and you've made decisions this year in moments. Perhaps it's in quiet times where the Lord's spoken to you. Maybe it's, it's, it's been at work. Maybe it's been at home with family. Maybe it's been at, at, at gatherings like this when, when we've got together. Maybe it's been during worship or a message, something sparked and the Holy Spirit's highlighted to you. And here's what I feel like God wants us to do. I feel like the word God said to me was, let's bring closure to 2020. Let's bring a bit of closure to some of those things that God's been saying, that God's been doing, that God's been poking and prompting and so on. Because there are things that God's been trying to do in you. And here's what I know. Here's, here's my promise to you. Turning a page on a calendar won't change your life. In a few days' time, we're going to turn a page on a calendar. And you're going to hear New Year's resolutions and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Let me tell you something. If you're the same person who didn't do it, you'll probably be the same person who doesn't do it. If you want to change that, change this. Allow God to change this. Allow God to turn you into the person that He wants you to be. Get in that boat. Ride it with Jesus. Respond to Him. Listen to what He has to say to you.